I'd like to call to order, please, work session Monday, May 5th, 2014. Uh, we're all around the table this evening. We have two items on the work session. <coughs> I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, the first item uh, is to review and discuss the 2014 citizen survey result. Ro uh, Romina Canicio. Romina, how many of all I know her and how long I can't pronounce that name? Uh, Canicio. Remember, can your niece? <laughs> <laughs> I've given up. Did you hear what he just said? Can you just give us a second? That computer is <coughs> just finally loading. Okay. Well, you, uh, first of all, apologize for the you coughing. Hear what he just said? Yeah. And we have a technical delay. Yes. And it wasn't my mispronouncing of your, of your name that did that. It's uh, okay. Are you just, I, I, I caught that one. Uh, it's frozen. Did you see the little, is it circling up the top? No. How does that move? Yeah. I, I would turn off your microphones in a moment.
Councilman Stiff. Oh. So, that may I have a roll call I vote, him, please. He didn't hear me. Vice Mayor Pizzolo? Aye. Councilmember Osborne? Aye. Councilmember Loretano? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Stiff? Aye. Councilmember Holman? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. Pass the seven zero. All right, let's convene. You want to bring the grapes? <laughs> That's called brown nosing in some circles. <laughs> All right, let's reconvene the work session. Romina? Oh, special meeting uh, adjourned. We're now re reconvene the work session. of the citizen survey. A few weeks ago, you were um, given the, a binder with all of the results, and so we'll go through those tonight. Hopefully, you had a chance to review them. Um, Zemema Mann is the senior project manager with National Research Center. She's going to present the results and answer any questions you may have. But before we do that, I want to just do a quick recap of the process and, and how we got to where we are today. Uh, if you remember back in November um, at the work session, we decided to use the National Citizen Survey, um, and we decided to use National Citizen Survey, which is developed by the National Research Center. And the reason we're using it is because it provided a much more comprehensive review of our services while allowing for some of our customization. Um, in addition, the survey was designed um, and coordinated with the ICMA Center uh, for Performance Measure. And since the city participates in the ICMA CPM program, the results can be coordinated with the city's performance measure data, providing a whole new level of information that we had not had in the past. Uh, during that same work session, council provided direction to add custom features that included 3,000 surveys mailed out, the four custom questions that are in your packet were number 14, 15, 16, and 17. Oh. I clicked on it. There it goes. Um, the online option available to those that received the survey. So if you received a survey in the mail, you were given the option to go ahead and go online and log on and, and fill it out rather than the paper. And then a bilingual survey available upon request. Um, I think we had two people call and request for a bilingual survey, so we provided that to them. Uh, quickly, <coughs> the survey process began in January. What, and there was, I believe there was a timeline provided in there, and if there wasn't, I know that we had sent that to you when we first started the uh, survey. The first step in that was a pre-notification postcard which was sent out on January 3rd to all those people that were selected. The surveys were then mailed the first round on January 10th and then the second round on January 17th. Data collection began immediately and uh, finished up and wrapped up around February 21st. And then the analysis began. We received a draft report, which is what you actually have in your binders. We got that to you when we received it. The, there was no difference between the final and the draft. We just put it into final format, and we can provide that to you if you need it. But it's pretty much exactly what you have in your binders. And that was provided to us. The final report was provided to us on April 21st. Uh, with that, if you don't have any questions for me, I'm going to turn it over to Mema to go over the results. Mayor, just real quick. Yes, uh, Joe? Just for the record, can you address the statistical, I'll get that right, soundness of the survey? Uh, I'm sure Demema can. She can go through kind mm -hmm. of what the, the, how they do it and, and what the sound well, I mean is. with a delta and that it's a statistically sound survey. Yes, I guess is right. the point it I'm is. trying to get for the record. That, yes, okay. we'll have that. It's, it's part of her survey. Because people take surveys all the time, you Absolutely. know, call up and they're not statistically Statistically, statistically sound. That's what <laughs> sure. happens with a five-hour plane flight. But uh, yeah, that's what I think it's real important as we go through here is, is to uh, stress that is a statistically sound survey. Well, welcome, Ms. Mann. Thank you for being here. 
Thank you for having me. Um, thank you, Ramina, for that introduction. And also, she's been our main contact uh, throughout this project and she really made things much easier on us, as those of you that work with her here probably know. Uh, so I'll just kind of try and quickly go through my first few slides that are a little bit of background on the NCS or the National Citizen Survey, since Ramina just uh, gave a bit of an intro. But as she said, um, it's um, a survey done by my firm, National Research Center, in partnership with ICMA. And also uh, through ICMA, we're also partnered with the National League of Cities. It's designed to be uh, mostly a turnkey, uh, mostly standardized survey. Uh, of about five pages, and close to one full page of that um, is set aside for the custom questions that Ramina worked with you on. And uh, the nice thing about the level of standardization about the National Citizen Survey is that we're able to give a high quality survey at a relatively low cost. It's been used by about 400 communities across the nation, including many others in Maricopa County. Um, and also that level of standardization around the questions allows us to provide benchmark items for each item on the survey. So in addition to getting your ratings, I'm going to be able to tell you if that rating is below the average of what we typically see, uh, similar to it, or higher than it. And uh, if you've had a chance to review your reports, you'll see that um, the NCS reporting is uh, organized around these eight facets of community livability. And we've derived these facets from uh, extensive research um, regarding models for community livability. So you'll see us talking often about um, safety, mobility, natural environment, built environment, economy, recreation and wellness, education and enrichment, and community engagement as they relate to livability overall. <coughs> uh, as Ramina mentioned, it was a multi-contact mailed survey of 3,000 households. The overall response rate was 26 percent, and that's an average range for this kind of survey. So that's, that's about what we expect to see. And um, with that number of respondents, that gives us a margin of error around the results of plus or minus 4 percent. So what that means to, to us is that if we were able to survey every resident in Goodyear, which would, of course, um, be much more expensive. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a trade-off for, for cost versus, you know, exact precision. Um, but if we were to be, to be able to survey every household in Goodyear, we would expect the results to be within plus or minus 4 percent of these results. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. In addition to having the survey available online and in Spanish, as Ramina mentioned, uh, we also um, have broken out results by geography, by the uh, planning districts, uh, north, central, and south, and also by some of the socio-demographic questions on the survey. So those are two standalone reports you've got in your packet, and I'll be talking, I'll be referring to those somewhat uh, throughout the presentation, but it's a great way to delve a little bit deeper into some of the findings. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the benefits of doing the National Citizen Survey is getting these benchmark ratings, so I'll be talking about these as well. These are the average ratings that we have created based on all the other jurisdictions in our comparison database. And speaking of those, um, there were 129 items on Goodyear's survey that were able to be compared to our database. Uh, as you can see, almost all of them received similar ratings, um, which are, that's a positive thing that's very solid um, and that's what we would hope to see in a, in a community. And then you had about a dozen that really stood out and got uh, ratings that are higher. Uh, in fact, some, in some cases much higher, um, some of the highest that we've seen in, in some categories when compared to all the other communities in our database. And then there were about a dozen that received um, some lower ratings as well. And I'll talk about those a little more, get into some specifics. Um, here are the, those eight key focus areas again, or the eight facets of community livability. One of the questions on the survey asks residents um, to rate how important each of these items are for the city of Goodyear to focus on in the coming two years. And uh, safety and economy, with the stars on them, emerged as the most important according to residents. Now I'll go over some key findings and show you some evidence that supports the key findings that we derived from reading your results and analyzing them. Um, hopefully this one's not a surprise to anybody in the room that Goodyear residents enjoy a very high quality of life. 
uh, at least eight and ten respondents, and in some cases as many as um, nine and ten or ninety-five percent even, uh, gave ratings of excellent or good to the quality of life in Goodyear, Goodyear as a place to live, as a place to raise children, and as a place to retire. Um, the three lighter colored blue items on the slide, those first three, were all similar to the benchmark comparison. And Goodyear as a place to retire was rated higher than the benchmark. So that was one of the standout areas for Goodyear. And when we um, did some of that additional analyses and, and broke the results out by some of the sociodemographics, uh, one of them was by looking at responses by age. <coughs> and uh, Goodyear residents aged 55 and older gave even higher ratings um, to the, the city as a place to retire than younger residents. So perhaps people that may be retired here or have some experience with it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, other ratings that were quite high as they relate to quality of life uh, had to do with the overall appearance and the overall image of Goodyear. At least 80% uh, rated those as excellent or good as well. And um, when looking at those results by geography, we did see a difference. Um, those in the north planning area <coughs> tended to give the highest ratings uh, for those items. One of the custom questions that the city chose to include had to do with information sources. Um, it's clearly a priority for the city to get information to residents in a, in a timely manner and um, you know see how they're engaging with it. Uh, this question was asked on a scale of major source, minor source, or not a source. And there were several items that were listed out as um, potential information sources about city government and its activities. These, um, the percents you see here, are the percent that said major source. So 66% said the city website was a major source of information. Um, and if we add that with the percent that said minor source, 91% said it was at least a minor source. So people are clearly using the website. Uh, they're also definitely reading the InFocus newsletter, 56% uh, saying major source, and 88% saying at least a minor source, uh, then followed by local media outlets. I think that's encouraging, the 66% that found the website, so you can see how important it is that yeah. we're investing, we're in, investing in our website. Yeah. Um, so yes. Can you ask questions? Of already? course you can ask questions. Wally? Okay, I'd like to, uh, I can't seem to find a map of Goodyear that tells me what you're talking about when you say north, central, and south, and, and, and I miss sure. the page. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't put one in the presentation, but there is a map, I believe, in the technical I have one. I can put it up on Elmo, or do you want to just hand Well, I'd like to have it afterwards, because oh. when you're talking oh, yes. north to me, north is everyone from I-10 north. So I'm not sure if central is uh, I-10 to the yeah. river. Right. Is that central? That's, yeah, that's yes. central. And then, and then up so is, is, is Straya. South. So in, in the south, and we only had 123 people up there that answered the survey? I find that hard to believe. I really do. I mean, those are the, I can show you the map. That's exactly oh. what the map is. Well, yeah. Well, <coughs> well, yeah, I'd like just a so copy see, of I'll it. put a copy of it for you, but just so you can visually see, that's exactly what you have, which is south of the river. And then central. Does this mean if this, did three people answer here? That's what it looks like. Yes. Well, Nina, can you put that on Elmo yes. for the rest of the? And overall, the, uh, That's actually really interesting if you stop and look at it. I mean, it's just really an eye opener. Where do you see it? Overall, um, so the, the dots you're going to see here are approximately the houses that were the households that were selected to be part of the survey. Uh, so they're not going to be you know exactly to scale. They're going to be a lot layered on top of each other because it's 3,000 dots on a pretty small map. Um, but overall, this should mirror um, housing density. And we, we're going to get one of these, right? It's in your technical appendices report. It is in the technical part. The title of that one's technical appendices, and it's um, it's the last, almost to the last page. Yeah, here it is. Put the light back. Just uh, in front of communication ex examples. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, see that? Yeah. Page thirty-three. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is on the screen. Yeah. There it is. Hang on. There you go. Isn't that interesting that we didn't get that big of a Try to get it so that's from the Australia area. Hmm. 
Right. Can you see it though? It's too bright because of the I'm white. Not, I'm trying I'm to get it so that it's kind of shady. Because, uh, zoom in. Most of us have, uh, you know, identification on calls coming in, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I pick and choose who I'm going to answer the phone to. It's so, brighter. Well, I, I, yeah, I, I don't. Male, uh, I yeah, like yeah, or, or yeah, or male. But so I did hear from three folks that said, "Hey, I heard you know, again. Why yeah. did you waste yeah. another postcard to remind me of Mandy or something?" Yeah, so and I just laughed. And so I tried just, to cover yeah. our bases. I just don't know if they're like. So that's my on the phone, and then when things come in the mail, sometimes I have to tell you, look at it. It's something I, I rip it up and I throw it out immediately. And so uh, you have it to work against that, right? And if I, I pick up the mm -hmm. tray, uh, a lot of people don't have, I know a lot of our friends up there don't have landlines anymore. So in the mail, I hate to say it, when you're busy, it probably just gets lost. Yeah. And they probably think it was so, junk mail. So, yeah. Yeah. so getting so to the sure. citizen anymore is difficult because they have the choice of saying no to it, hanging up, or throwing it out. So, okay. yes, Sherilyn? I just wanted to ask again, the city website between a major source and what, what was the second? Minor source. Minor source. What was the number? Um, so for 66% said the website was a major source. That, but you added them together and it was what? 91%. Okay, so, and in so the in focus, could you do the same thing for me? 88%. 88%. I just would like to make a comment for all of those who think that people only get go to the web now a days, is that the in focus is a printed product and still 88% of our citizens are getting significant information out of it. I would just like to point to that because there tends to be a, 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 a philosophy that people are only going to the web for information. So that Thank you. I agree. I agree with you, and that's why we've saved in focus when the people wanted to get rid of it, and and we felt the value of it, and you know it's valuable because <coughs> you see the other magazines are being produced by other organizations mm -hmm. out there. So, so obviously I just it's wanted valuable. to. But thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank Go you. ahead. <clears throat> so yeah, Lainey, can you put it back on the presentation? Well, that brings us to our next key finding, uh, that the economy is a solidly rated focus area. So as I mentioned previously, um, if you see this little uh, graphic from the honeycomb here with the star, it's just a reminder that this was uh, one of the items that residents rated as the most important for the city to focus on in the coming two years. And we'll go into some ratings that have to do um, with Goodyear's economy. Uh, overall ratings were very positive. Uh, about 6 and 10 rated uh, the overall economic health, cost of living, and economic development services as excellent or good. Uh, ratings for economic health and economic development services were similar to the national benchmark average. Uh, ratings for cost of living were, were higher. Uh, they, were, they were well above that benchmark, so that's definitely notable. Uh, additionally, we asked residents um, if they thought the coming six months would have a positive impact on their own personal economic future, and 35% of Goodyear residents um, said that it would be somewhat or very positive. While that may seem like a low number, that's actually the second highest rating in our entire database. So um, the optimism that your residents are, are feeling about, about the economy is, is among the strongest we've seen anywhere. Thank you. Joe? Just just a question. Mm -hmm. Would you consider 35 a, a positive? Maybe the highest, but it still seems to me they're not very positive looking forward as far as what the economy is going to do if it's only 35 percent. Well, there's also a neutral um, option for that for that response option. So that's what I think most people fall into. It's not that you know 65 percent are saying that they feel negatively and only 35 percent feel positively. Um, you know, I know that a third of people saying somewhat or very positive isn't isn't. Dull. A lot. It's not a majority of the residents, but you know, taking into account how difficult the last years have been for most communities across this nation, and and seeing that it's, I think it's still very positive that Goodyear is number two, even if it's you know not a majority of residents. I just don't think any. I don't think anybody's going to get ratings of 50 percent or higher in this category. And I guess that's my point. Mm -hmm. You know, people are still a little bit suspect of where we're kind of going. So sure, cautious, and things have changed. But it still is some good news. Yes. I th absolutely. Does that kill the good news here? No, I'm just saying 35 percent to me is not good news, but that's okay. We can we can agree to disagree. Would hit fan. 
You say that 35% is somewhat or very positive. What was conversely? I'm, I don't know. Um, I have to take a seat. I don't have it right in front of me either, but I can find it for you. And what was the percentage there? <laughs> so 11 said very positive, 24 somewhat positive, 51% were neutral. So about half gave a neutral rating. 13% uh, said somewhat negative, and just 1% said very negative. Right, so <clears throat> More so people giving positive than, than negative yeah, ratings. That, that's what I was looking for. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, we asked some questions about working in Goodyear. Um, a majority, 58%, said that Goodyear is an excellent or good place to work. About 29% uh, gave employment opportunities, ratings of excellent or good. Uh, and again, while that 29%, um, you know, is not a majority saying excellent or good, that's it's similar to the benchmark. It's comparable to what we see in other communities. Uh, we also asked residents if they work inside Goodyear city limits or outside of Goodyear city limits, and about one third said that they work in Goodyear. And um, when we did that additional analysis, one of the ways we split out the data was looking at responses from those residents who said they work in Goodyear versus those who said they do not work in Goodyear. And perhaps not surprisingly, those that work in Goodyear gave higher ratings to Goodyear as a place to work and employment opportunities. Another one of the custom questions um, asked residents um, how important, if at all, it is for the city to add um, several different types of employers, and these were rated as the most important uh, for the city to attract. 84% um, said that it was essential or very important <coughs> for medical and health care employers to come to Goodyear, about 70% for office or professional services and also about 70% for retail employers to come to Goodyear. Uh, the other three items on the list were also rated as essential or very important by a majority, just not by quite as many. Um, that was um, high-tech manufacturing at 69%, so we're just right behind, and then service industry at 60%, and aerospace at 56%. It falls in line, because that's so, the direction we're going. I've got another question. Well, you're, you're apparently skipping around through our, you're not going to hit all of the areas. Correct. So I was very interested in, uh, on my page where it says figure 29, that overall in the draft, 47% support the arts. But, huh? Well, I'm on page 8. Page 8. And um, that, you know what section is? It's figure 29. Page eight. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's under in, um, uh, geographic subgroups. If you have your book. Comparison by geographic subgroups. Page eight. Yeah, page eight. Figure 29. It says supporting the arts. North 49. <coughs> Central 46. Valley 44. Overall 47. But mm -hmm. improving and maintaining our parks is 89. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I do have a slide where we're going to talk a little bit more about okay. about this really custom question. And that was one of our key findings. Um, you're, you're sort of already getting there for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, is that there's a lot of support for improving uh, parks and recreation in the Not city. Not so much in the arts, but a lot. Yeah. <coughs> all of the life <coughs> for the families or something. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. got one more economy slide here. Um, a, at least a majority of respondents gave excellent or good ratings to the quality of businesses and service establishments in Goodyear, shopping opportunities, and public places where people like to spend time. Uh, and those ratings were all similar to the benchmark, uh, good, positive, solid ratings, uh, but did want to point out that um, only 30% gave excellent or good ratings to the overall quality of downtown slash commercial areas in Goodyear. And I know that's something that you said. And you residents know that too. I think it's pretty good. 33% working for a non existent downtown. Yeah. Where were those 30% looking at? I tell you what, they don't know we don't have downtown. What I do think that is good, and I think for our business after it would really be good, is to let those businesses know in Goodyear sort of just kind of tell them, hey, listen, I, I don't know if somebody has given you a, yeah. a kudo lately, mm -hmm. but let me tell you how the people really feel about 
your small businesses and what you're doing for good year. So well, I'd like to see something. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that yeah, is you're a small business. Well, and, and that is true, but it also, within here, it said that 98% of our citizens shopped in Goodyear. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it all goes together, and I think yeah. that's... So anyway, that is just awesome. to... Mm -hmm. Excellent point. The, the next key finding um, has to do with mobility and public transportation. Um, Goodyear got extremely high ratings for ease of travel around the city. Um, travel by car and traffic flow were above the benchmark comparison. The, all the items here on the slide were rated as excellent or good by a majority of residents. And um, travel by car and traffic flow are among some of the highest ratings in our database compared to other comparison jurisdictions. Um, ease of travel by car ranked 10th out of 264 communities that have recently asked this question. And traffic flow ranked 6th out of 295 other communities. Can I talk? Can I bring it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm more good. Well, page five. Um, traffic signal timing, 56%. I would like to see that a lot higher, and I'm, I'm sure when we get all of the fiber optic cable in mm -hmm. in our lifetime, it will be much better. <laughs> Although I must say, I'm surprised it's 56%. I am very surprised. Yeah. Uh, Bill? I had an awesome one-on-one -on -one meeting with Bob and Luke on Friday and Mario. Um, somebody else was in the room. On a traffic signal? It was Matt. But anyway, on traffic signals and, and they were able to break it down to a very simplistic reason why we can't get us any more synchronized than we already are. At this I time? Strongly At this time? No. Period. Ever? So my strong suggestion is if you have a concern, sorry, Bob, get with Bob. <coughs> I'll get you with Luke. <laughs> um, it was the last three years. It's, it is the correct, the answer's been right. It's the methodology behind the synchronization that it actually takes a whiteboard and a chart, but you can do it very simplistically because I understood it, but it was a great explanation. So I'm, I just strongly encourage everybody you and I, Wally, have been sitting here complaining for as three long years, as we've been on here years. about how messed up it is, and it's finally, for me, it's at least clear. I don't like it, but it's clear. Uh, could I have Brian, you speak about this? Yes, I would like to, uh, in, instead of reaching out individually, we will have three <laughs> items uh, on next Monday night's agenda, May 12th, that we'll talk about additional fiber projects that we're doing. Uh, and uh, we, we looked at that this morning. We decided it would be a great opportunity to show you what we have now <coughs> and what these three new projects will do. And we'd also like to talk about how this fits into the whole game plan as far as uh, traffic management. So we'll actually have that on the business agenda next Monday night, and we'll go into the details that uh, Council Member Stipp was just referring to. So you do not have to reach out individually. We will have that in okay. front of the whole council. So, so so sorry we get off track like this. Right. Okay. Sherry. I, I just want to say, I, I think when we look at, I know where this number comes from. We look at, like, what was it? How many of our people commute out? It was a pretty high number. Commute out. So we're driving out of Goodyear to other cities. And although we would like ours more synchronized, I will tell you from driving an hour to get here today from downtown, it's a lot worse other city. I mean, it's horrid. So I, I think when people see that, they come back and they have to wait for a minute at Estrella because it's not time. It's a lot better than 20 minutes in Scottsdale waiting to get through an intersection. So we're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, this this may not be a surprise, but you know you have quite high ratings for most of the mobility um, items. However, public transportation um, about just about a third gave excellent or good ratings to uh, travel by public transportation and bus or transit services, and those items are lower than the benchmark comparison. So the, those are among you know the handful of no items. surprises that are lower. there. And um, last key finding is that residents want more parks and recreation opportunities and higher education in Goodyear. So this ties in um, to that custom question uh, that Council Member Campbell was referring to. Uh, this question asked residents uh, to rate how important it is for the city to fund 
um, each of the following programs or amenities in order to improve the quality of life for residents in Goodyear. And so the items you see here on the slide were at the top of that list. Um, this is the percent essential or very important. So you can see that you know, almost all um, said maintaining and improving parks was important. About three quarters um, said providing recreational opportunities and about seven and ten saying bringing higher education. Um, still rated as important by a majority, just not quite as many, uh, was providing senior services, providing child care and after school programs, investing in, and investing in transit, um, and building a community center, just about 51 percent. And uh, then just still important but not quite by a majority was supporting the arts building a city center slash city hall and building a performing arts center. Mm. Found it at the bottom of the list. Of course, a community center could be uh, actually uh, put in with providing recreational opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could add that 52 yeah. to that. That comes over 100. Is that the new man? <laughs> Joe's been teaching me. Yeah, is that the new one? Yeah. That's good, Joe. No, no, I haven't been teaching her that. I'm, I'm not even touching it. Go ahead. Can I, can I make oh, a comment? Uh, that was one of the things I mentioned um, to, to staff at one point, and I, or I think it was another consultant, is that we're calling community center. And I don't think that defines anything because what we have in Loma Linda Park is called the Goodyear Community Center. And if anybody is thinking that, <laughs> you know, I mean, when they're, obviously, I don't think that's what people are it's thinking. And I really think, you know, uh, I said, well, what happened to the multi-gen facility? And they said, well, we don't want to call it multi-gen. And I think we need to start being more specific or more descriptive of what kind of when we put the term community center down because it could go from a fifty thousand structure dollar structure like we have at Loma Linda to a fifty million dollar structure which I think is probably what Rio uh, is in Peoria the real Vista real Vista thank you um, in Peoria I mean because that's obviously so I mean I just think we need to be more descriptive about a community sure. center because I don't think that really tells us a lot what people were thinking I think that's an excellent point thank you. it's a recreational center instead I yeah know, I, something I don't yeah know. So yeah. I just That's think it needs to be somehow. Multi-generational multi center is multi-use, multi-gen, yeah. multi multi not a meeting room. Right. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. All the other major meeting rooms. <laughs> <laughs> no, not like the pool. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> we'll, we'll stop. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, so also looking at some of the parks and recreation uh, and education ratings um, from some of the standard items on the survey to see how people think about you know what it is that you're offering now. Um, they did get ratings um, by a majority of respondents as excellent or good and they were all similar to the benchmark comparisons. So you know perhaps it's that um, you know clearly residents are satisfied and it's similar to what we see in other communities and maybe they want to be wowed. <laughs> uh, so just to, to recap those key findings um, Quality of life is extremely high here, and that was definitely reflected in the survey results. Overall, results were very positive. Uh, residents clearly value the focus on the economy. Uh, the, mobi the mobility ratings uh, definitely stood out, and um, certainly there's the desire for perhaps additional parks and recreation. Any questions? Just a, uh, Joe? Yeah. As I was going through the detail, if I read it correctly, there was a significant percentage of our, uh, our younger people leaving the city to go out to shop or for enter entertainment ve uh, venues. Uh, oh, right. and, and I guess my question is, I realize here we've got you know, desire for existing more in park and recreation facilities. And I don't disagree that you know, there should be an emphasis, but when I think of recreation, you know, I, I think of more than just outdoors, you know, for uh, Little League and, and hikes and hiking trails, et cetera. I, see, I, I personally see recreation more for things for people, why they're leaving the city to go outside to enjoy, you know, whether it's, um, you know, um, and again, you've heard from me either, you know, some uh, non, what do you call it, restaurants that aren't, you know, the chains, 
um, you know, maybe a nice movie theater, maybe, a, you know, a nice place that has <coughs> bowling and you know, maybe sports and arcades for the family to all enjoy. That's what I also kind of see when I see recreation on top of the other. So maybe you um, can discuss that. I see that on uh, figure 31 on page nine under uh, comparisons. And that's what kind of got caught dining. my attention. Yeah, that's what kind of caught dining. my attention. Figure 31, you do dining and, and performances and seeing movie. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody wants to look but at that. But that's what I meant. The people who yeah. were leaving to go outside mm -hmm. because those amenities weren't here. I, I think that's a good point. It's, it's certainly possible that that's when they think of recreation, they're thinking of. A little broader than just. Mm -hmm. uh, More than just fitness kinds yeah. of opportunities. Yeah, it really shows the percentages are pretty. So that could be an area, you know, we can do, um, we can help facilitate focus groups if, you want, if you're interested in digging deeper. Um, if that is something that is a focus of the city and you wanted to do a kind of a shorter, just topical survey really targeted at that or even targeting specific demographics to ask them those to get that clarified, that's something that we could potentially help you dig deeper with. Thank you. Any other questions? That's it. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for contending with our silliness here once in a while and getting <laughs> off topic a little bit. We're kind of that way. <laughs> so, um, but well, we are. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know. I know. But um, so we, we ask very good questions. We do. Me. Yes, and they are very constructive too. I'll correct I'm myself. Glad to see an engagement. So, uh, but I think this is very valuable, and I'm I'm assuming we're going to hear some response from our citizens from this uh, because it is very telling. So, but it's not in. Uh, it's it's quite in line, I think, with the direction we're going in. Does any, let me throw that out to the council. Oh. Do you feel like this was uh, anybody commenting on that besides me, Bill? <coughs> Sorry, I um. You know, looking at the data that we that we received, you know, I'm going to say a couple of months, but it may not have been that long ago, and that is very much right on. That everything that we put forward together in our strategic plan and our strategic focus areas really um, are now supported by this citizen data, and um, you know, for us that becomes important as we take on the budget and and I think move forward for the rest of the year. So, um, if nothing else, this at least uh, gives us a good foundation to really hold our heads up and say, yep, we are doing what everybody wants. Good. Any other comments? Joanne? Well, I was going to save it more for the budget discussions. Um, I still not, I think that there are very, um, very good indicators that we are going in the right direction and we are doing the things that we need to do. And I'm very pleased with that. And I am also pleased at how we are, are, are saving our money towards the things that we desire and want. And I think those are important. Um, now, I'm, you know, I'm a meeting behind you all, in a sense, of the budget discussions. Oh, oh, well, you know, not. You're coming up to yeah, it. I know. And I think that when I look at the draft Parks and Rec um, plan that we were given, and I look at this survey, and then I'm looking at the budget that we have in front of us, I, I, I feel like there's more money that could be spent towards Park and Rec. And that's one thing that has bothered me. When I know it's a balancing act that we have, and uh, it's a tough one to figure out, but above the weeds, looking at all this, I feel like there's some things that are taking priority that don't necessarily need to take priority, where more money should be spent on Parks and Recreation. So. That's my okay. Joe. And again, just to piggyback what others are saying is, and I understand the parks and the recs, and I also believe that's important, but also believe it's important to get those amenities that people are leaving the city to go to because they're not here. But that's not where our money goes. Okay. We've got to get people but, to come in. I'm going to kind of get in on this as the mayor right now. I think we're, we're moving budget into into this, and I, we're okay. going to go into this next, and you can bring it all back up again in a moment. Uh, and let's okay. not take away from what this was. Well, no, I'm addressing this. I'm not, oh, okay. I'm, I'm not talking budget. Okay. I'm just right. saying focus on when we talk about, you know, um, you know, where we spend uh, our money as far as encouraging businesses, economic development coming here with our strategic plan is to go, off of the, uh, go after those amenities that we don't have here because people are leaving going outside of our cities right. to go there. It's nothing to do with budget. It's just where we put our efforts when we're going out there trying to bring and draw businesses here. It's not just jobs, even right. though that's important. 
uh, quality of life issues as far as where people have the opportunity to go and spend their money in the evenings is just to me as important as building those jobs here as well. Because if they're leaving outside the go, then they may want to leave to, to build their house there as well. Or may want to go to work out there because it's closer to where they're going after work. So Traffic I think it's, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, I think you have to take it all into its entirety to make sure that we also focus on that. It has nothing to do with the budget. I'm talking about when we attract those type of amenities into <coughs> our entire city. But this gives us at least a, a, a good pathway to it. So I appreciate it. Thanks so much. No okay. problem. And just as a quick follow up, the yeah. map that Councilmember Campbell uh, needs, I'll give a hard copy and I'll put it in each one of your boxes so we can add it to your and I'll send it by electronically so you have it uh, as well in your in your computer in your email. Sure. Well we can't put the copy of the draft or is this it? It's the exact same thing. It's the same thing. They just the only difference is that it says final instead of draft on it, but it's the exact same thing. I so could I'm more than happy to reprint page. it no, for you. No, no, that's okay. I that's just okay. that she gave a different category like what mine said. She doesn't have the middle of the road one. I don't have the middle of the road one. What what was it you said? The, the livability report? Mm, no, when you had the categories, high, low, and then you said in some of them were yeah. like in a neutral. What, it, but it was the, ben, the benchmarks, the yeah. slide about the benchmarks. <coughs> that was that's just a slide in the presentation. It's not. Oh, okay. there's no summary oh, like okay. that in the report. Okay, thank you. Okay, all I'm right. good. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Okay, now the council will receive information uh, on and discuss, <coughs> and we can come into the budget now, the estimated fiscal year of 2014-15 draft budget. Kim Bradford, interim budget research manager to present, and also our C director, Larry Lang, here. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present um, we are um, presenting the entire draft budget this evening. Uh, as you know, we've been doing a lot of work, uh, not only in the past few months, but also especially over the last several weeks, reviewing the various components. And so the intent today is to bring all of that together and review those high-level components. Certainly, as I'm not going through all the details, if there are specific questions about uh, department budgets or initiatives, we can certainly um, address those and discuss those as the goal is to make sure that we are uh, understanding if there's any additional follow-up or direction from Council to prepare you for the tentative adoption on the 19th. Uh, so I will uh, recap a little bit about the budget process, where we are, the framework that has guided us since the retreat in November, uh, which you've seen. I will do a high-level review of the budget components, dive a little bit into the operating budget, and cover the property tax, the capital improvement plan, and debt service. So our process, we are here um, on May 5th, the black box highlighted in red, so you'll see the various meetings that we've had to date. Uh, and as I mentioned, we do um, have tentative budget adoption scheduled for May 19th. Uh, we do have the ability to schedule an additional work session next Monday if we do have follow-ups that result from this meeting, so uh, that is an option as well. Nice. Joe? How did the, uh, I wasn't able to uh, attend, how did the budget um, form go on Wednesday? Yes, I, um, I actually have a slide, I'll cover okay. that, uh, but we That's did, uh, we had three um, citizens that attended that, and I'll cover not only that, but also some of the other public outreach okay. that we've been doing throughout the process. Uh, so briefly on the budget framework, uh, this, as I mentioned, was developed after our retreat and uh, really has been kind of the guiding principle for how we've approached the budget. Um, not only the conservative uh, approach to our uh, revenue projections, but also our expenditures, uh, making sure that we're really evaluating through our performance measure program and workload indicators the approach to recommendations that we were bringing forward for the supplementals or the new funding beyond our base budgets. Um, and again, as you kind of just heard with the citizen satisfaction survey, our goal is to really make sure that we are bringing forward programs that maintain that high quality of life that our citizens are enjoying today. So a high level picture regarding the proposed fiscal year 15 budget. Uh, at the retreat, we did review the current uh, budget and tax policies and received direction to keep those as they are today. Uh, which has been the foundation for the work that we've done to date. 
Our proposed budget does maintain our contingency levels as established by budget policy, and we are, as I reviewed last week, in 100% compliance with our established budget policies for fiscal year 15. Our total budget is $222 million. In, in terms of context, our budget that was adopted this year is $205 million, so that is about an 8% increase over what we have today. Our operating portion, which I will go through um, some of these components in more detail as we go through the presentation, uh, but for all funds is $92 million. Uh, we do have 62.9, that is the general fund operating portion of that, and I will go through how we've structurally balanced that for fiscal year 15. Our proposed capital improvement plan, as you recall, we've developed a 10-year plan, and um, the fiscal year 15 programs that are proposed are the ones that will actually receive appropriations when you adopt the budget. That totals just about $28 million. And uh, in line what we've heard as far as uh, investing in the economy and the sustainability of the city, a lot of those uh, projects for fiscal year 15 are focused on growth. We did uh, include our infrastructure improvement plan projects into the plan, and you'll see that as I go through that in a little bit. Uh, and then also investing in technology and facilities as we've um, discussed previously. And as was mentioned, we really maintain that focus on our four strategic priorities that are not only in our strategic plan, but also our priority-based budgeting results, uh, which you see here. So a couple of slides on just overall big picture highlights of the budget. Uh, again, starting with that growth and economic development piece, uh, as we talked about uh, previously and also you heard a little bit in the last presentation, uh, we have been working on several major plans for the city, including our transportation master plan, which I believe that's the work session you have next week, uh, the parks master plan, economic development strategic plan, and also we'll be adopting the um, uh, general plan in November that will be up for election. And so uh, part of what we are doing is we are um, looking at how does that impact the big picture, the long-term vision of the city. And one of the focuses that we will have at this year's retreat is there are a lot of needs and priorities identified in those plans. And how do we prioritize and advance those? Because as we talk about the budget, uh, obviously we have finite resources. We have laid out a plan uh, the, in the CIP that's good for 10 years, but we do review that every year. And so that's the opportunity to really understand, are we hitting the mark or do we need to make some adjustments now that we have those plans in place? Uh, also, a strong policy direction that we've had um, both in the strategic plan and also in the city manager's goals has been to uh, maintain and preserve our existing assets. And so as we've talked over the last several weeks, um, we've made recommendations that support that initiative. That includes our asset management program, not only through technology, but staff. And also um, looking at establishing a replacement fund. So as I go through uh, those budget initiatives, you will see we do have $5 million to establish a replacement fund. Uh, and that's really citywide, and it's <coughs> intended to be seed money. So as we get those plans developed and prioritized, then we have the ability to start moving those forward. But that will also give us a sense of, is that adequate, or do we need additional funding as we move forward? Uh, because that will not only include um, things like our pavement management, but also traffic signals, street lights, uh, the median, we've talked about the unimproved medians that we have around the city, how do we get those improved, as well as maintain the irrigation and replace it when it needs, and the plant and trees in the medians, as well as our rolling fleet, which are not captured in our overall fleet replacement program, but we do have smaller equipment needs um, that this fund would also help support. So um, that's been something we have incorporated. And then also investing in employees. Uh, you've heard our city manager say this several times, that employees are our greatest asset and uh, really are the way that we get the day-to-day -day services delivered to our residents and also our business community. And so we had a presentation a couple weeks ago on some of the recommendations with um, health care and compensation. And so built into the budget proposal, we do have uh, those cost considerations. That includes a 5% one-step increase for our sworn police <coughs> and fire staff as per our agreement, and then also an average 3% compensation adjustment for non-sworn staff, which would be allocated based on where they fall in their individual pay grades and which quartile they're in, but average citywide it's 3%. 
Uh, and then also, as I mentioned, some uh, recommended positions. We do have 16 new positions, which we went through. And uh, again, in the council packet, we had a very rigorous process as far as the uh, workload indicators and the justification for bringing those forward and really focusing on areas of uh, public safety, parks, uh, rights of way maintenance, technology, and um, streets and traffic. Also, I touched a little bit on public safety. Uh, we do have recommendations in there for two additional patrol officers, as well as some supplementals for our property and evidence program. Uh, we did purchase a new evidence facility, and so included in the budget is a recommendation for uh, funding for tenant improvements to make that facility uh, usable for the uh, long term for us. And then also our fire prevention program, which as you've heard through various work sessions with the fire chief on how we continue to enhance that program based on our management audit. Uh, we have an additional inspector position and then also training uh, to help uh, keep our focus on improving that program. And then our public amenities, um, not only sustaining the community events that we see and enjoy today, but also um, some of those parks improvements. During our department-based budget presentations, uh, the Parks Department presented how they analyze the performance of all our existing parks and identify and prioritize where we may need to invest those funds. So we've programmed that in the capital improvement plan, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, also using that um, performance measurement as to where we are investing those funds. And then also some recommendations to um, do some repairs at the Loma Linda pool. Um, as I mentioned, we also have median enhancements. There are four areas that have been identified as a priority for fiscal year 15. And so we will be improving those medians and then also advancing the um, arts and culture master plan as well. Question, Joanne? Kim, the, um, the property and evidence facility, is this just a carryover? Because I thought we had, um, when we agreed to the purchase of the building, we knew that it was going to take um, funds. I thought they were one-time funds for this current year, not, is this just carryover that you're highlighting for next year? The highlight for next year is actually the tenant improvements. Right, and so right. when council had the presentation, that dollar amount is still the same. It has not changed. What we did is we actually um, did the purchase and then we also had funding for tenant improvements, which was for next right. year's budget. But that way, when you were approving the purchase, you saw the whole picture. So the but funds- But it's next year's, but it's within next year's budget rather than this year's, uh, one time. Fund. That's what I was thinking was this year's one time funds. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the communications piece, not only uh, the public outreach that we've been doing through the web and in focus, but also the public budget forum. Uh, but then also go into those uh, components of the budget. And so as I mentioned, as I go through this, if there are questions about any uh, particular issues, please feel free to bring those up. I'm not going to dive in, but certainly we want to make sure that council um, has any questions or uh, follow-ups addressed. So regarding the public communication and involvement, uh, we do have our standard uh, meeting broadcast, not only live, all the work sessions, but also via archive so anybody can go on and pull all the materials or watch the presentations. Uh, but we also had in the in focus, we had information in May talking about the budget strategy and also advertising the public budget forum, which was held last week, and I'll touch on that. I'm going to interrupt you right there. Is that going to go on the website? Yes, the, okay. the public budget forum. Okay. Yes. Thank yes. you. Um, we have done uh, a lot of work with the Transparency in Government page on our website, which is really where all our budget information is focused and also worked with the communications office to um, not only enhance and make that, that site easier to view, but also link it to our social media outlets through Facebook and Twitter, and then also the hot topics on our, way, our main website, and that way people who have signed up to get e-notify are receiving information. So what we've done, the Arizona League of Cities actually produced a, a quick two-minute video um, that is a very good explanation of why uh, it's important for people to be involved in the budget process, so we posted that as they distributed that. What we've done is we've actually um, summarized each of the discussions, so as we've held each work session, 
a, a quick bulleted list of what was covered and then also the discussion and direction regarding that topic has been posted on the website and communicated out through our social media avenues as well as the next upcoming meeting. So we've been really uh, trying to enhance uh, if people aren't watching the meetings, just trying to get that out to, to let them know what was going on. We also activated our public feedback form, which is on that site. That's been up since January, and that has also been a link in all those updates that have gone out. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we had our public budget form last week. The city manager presented and reviewed um, not only some highlights from this fiscal year, but also our <coughs> priorities, some of which I've highlighted here. Um, in fact, I think the same ones I've highlighted here for next year and then also presented the recommended budgets uh, for the departments as well as our capital plan and debt service. Uh, we did have three citizens that attended. We did not receive any public comment or questions for follow-up from that meeting. Uh, also just want to note um, we have not received any emails or feedback through the other mechanisms that we've been sending information out. Um, Wally? I attended that meeting and I do want to tell Kim and our city manager that the next day I saw one of our residents who attended the meeting and she thanked us for being uh, so patient and really explaining what the budget was and that she really felt she learned a lot mm -hmm. and she uh, thanked us for having that public meeting and I wanted to thank you both because your presentations was it was excellent. excellent. Thank you. And, and as I mentioned, uh, that, that video is just being finalized. The presentation is up on the, the transparency website, uh, and the video links will be posted there as well and sent out. So in regards to our overall budget, as I mentioned, $222 million is the total proposed for fiscal year 15. I'll touch on each of these um, components here, and you'll see on there we have comparisons to, to this current year, so you can see how we compare. And then as I go through the presentation, I'll touch on each of those segments uh, individually to give you a high-level uh, view of what those look like. So our operating budget, as I've mentioned, is $92 million. That is our ongoing base budgets for our departments, plus about $5 million in one-time supplementals. And that is all funds. Um, of our general fund, we do have $62.9 million in the general fund, and I'll go into that in a moment. For our capital projects, that is our capital improvement plan, and as I mentioned, we do have new projects proposed for fiscal year 15. I will review those. They are just under $28 million. This number here reflects also appropriations that were given in previous year budgets. As you know, most of our capital improvement projects are pretty time intensive, and so it's not uncommon that they don't finish within one fiscal year. So we do have um, carryover in uh, some of those projects. Our debt service is $25.8 million. You can see that's pretty comparable to where we were um, this year. Our one-time budget initiatives total $13.6 million. Uh, that is the information that we covered last in the last presentation. That includes not only the uh, recommended funding for the replacement fund, but also the standard items that we typically budget, like our fleet replacement, um, IT reserve, and, and risk reserve. And then the last two categories on there are ones that I would say we typically don't spend um, in our budget. Uh, first, the contingency, that 16.3, that is our three-month operating reserve per our policies, and so unless there's some kind, some kind of emergency, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we typically don't spend that. And then the 31.1 million is the potential placeholder and that is the segment of when we talked about the revenues where we retain capacity in our budget in case we have a potential improvement district, district or any grants that come in. Because when the council adopts the budget, it is a maximum amount, we do reserve capacity every year for uh, additional revenue, but that money is not spent unless we have additional revenue that, that comes in. I just do want to point out here before I go uh, deeper into um, some of the, the operating budget that as part of the council packets, uh, we did give you the draft schedules that are in the budget book. Those are all the city schedules, number 1 through 11. Um, that has uh, every number that adds up to $222 million. And so 
Uh, certainly, if you have any questions about those, um, we can answer that as well. But that kind of gives you the level of detail as far as what are we transferring, what's the carryover, uh, operating budgets by category, That's personnel. Joe? Just one general question, either you or Larry, on the uh, reserve funds and the funded depreciation. When you get the capital, is it when you get the actual asset management system in place, you'll know what percentage you currently are as far as funding is concerned? Is that a, is, is, is that a fair? Uh... Um, yes, Vice Mayor Pazilla, I'd say that's a fair assessment. Okay. Uh, once we have every um, uh, inventory completed, then we'll know where does that $5 million get us? Is it 10% or 15%? Okay. So I'll get into the uh, operating budgets, and the first couple of slides will focus on the general fund. This slide you've seen previously, and it is our general fund revenue projections. And uh, as we've talked about, we have 79.2 million, which is our revenue. Uh, for our purposes, and for the next slide specifically, the, the important number on here is that 73.2. That is our ongoing uh, general fund revenue, and that is what we use when we are gauging are we structurally balancing our general fund budget. <coughs> so what you'll see here is um, that that 73.2, and then we also add in our transfers from our enterprise funds, which is 2.8 million. That gives us the 76 million of ongoing general fund revenues. And then subtracting from that, we have our general fund operating budget, which is the 62.9 million that I've mentioned. We also have our transfers out, which is 10.3 million, and that is for our stadium fund. That's not only the debt service, but also our operational subsidy, and then our HERF program subsidy that we also um, include in that transfers out. And then our public improvement corporation bond set aside. Uh, as a reminder, we build the capacity in our base ongoing budget every year. We're increasing <coughs> that by 680,000 approximately every year started in fiscal year 13 and we'll do that until 2019 to make sure we have the capacity for those debt service payments in the event that our AZSTA reimbursements are not started. So that capacity we take out of our base and you'll see for fiscal year 15 we have a balance of $800,000. I put a note on the slide that we did actually budget that within the proposed budget. It is uh, factored into our one-time funding recommendations. Um, and actually is actually something that Larry and I have talked about as a good uh, budgeting practice. So if we do see a change in our ongoing general fund revenue, those categories that I showed on the last slide, that we have the flexibility to respond to that without a detrimental effect to our operating budget uh, if we do happen to see a change in that regard. Just, just a question. The transfer out, uh, transfers out, uh, Vanita's in there as well, correct? I mean, on the you yeah, got the stadium. Uh, the Herf. is actually a debt service. Oh, okay, uh, that's item, and I'm, okay. No, excuse me. That's what it was. is it fair to say that you have a two point eight million dollars structural surplus? Would that be fair to say? Yes. So in five years, we've gone from a sixteen million dollar, if I recall right, maybe it was thirteen yep, million dollars structural oh, deficit. Oh, was, it was it was Zoe? To now a two point eight million dollar structural surplus. Yes. Which I'm, I'm proud of that we've been able to do that. Absolutely. So. That's not a bad way to publicize yeah. it. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe. This pie chart shows our proposed operating budgets. And so, as I mentioned last week, we really spent uh, a lot of time going through the individual department budgets, um, what their proposed budget levels were, the recommended supplementals. <clears throat> Uh, and had some dialogue on that. This is a high-level representation of that. Again, you'll see that total operating budget number of 92 million. Our public safety is about a third of our operating budget. You'll see at 30.6 million. And then the next biggest slice there is our public works area, and that does include water, wastewater, and sanitation. Bless you. Uh, we also have parks, recreation, and stadium. Bless you. At 9.5 million, uh, that does include um, the stadium. I think I said that. And then support services is our uh, IT, human resources, and finance departments for a total of about 10% of our operating budget. And then the general government includes those areas such as the city manager's office, mayor and council office, city clerk, municipal court, and legal. 
And then uh, rounding that out, we have development and engineering, and that's the general fund portion of the engineering budget at $6.6 .6 million, and then streets, which is our HERF program, at $6 million. Joanne? Oh, I just wanted for the record it to be noticed that the parks, recreation, and stadium, if I have looked at it correctly, really um, parks and rec section of that is about half of it. Correct. Um, the stadium is, I believe, five million of it. Yeah. Are you saying that's not enough, or you? Four. What is what? Oh, it's back to it's just it's my overall feeling that parks and rec is not getting the amount it deserves. Uh, but we have to so. remember also we've made a commitment to uh, infrastructure <coughs> um, and water. Well, and, I said uh, it was a balancing that, act. Yeah, I, yeah, I understand yeah. that. It's just, it's yeah. my <coughs> feeling that but I it's not where it should be. I don't think so. any of us disagree. <coughs> and I think what we heard tonight was just a confirmation of how mm -hmm. you feel. I agree. I agree. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As we went through the work session last week um, and talked about all the individual department budgets, we did have a couple of follow-ups that I wanted to circle back on. Uh, the first point that I wanted to make is we did not make any budgetary changes, so the numbers that were presented last week are represented in the presentation this evening. Uh, we did have a couple of items. First was there is a supplemental for $13,000 for a parks pilot after school program. Mm -hmm. And the, there were a couple of questions on that. First, the proposed pilot was related to a charter school. And so there was a question of whether or not there was any gifting concerns. And then also probably the larger discussion of is that where we want to focus a pilot program uh, at a charter school. So uh, in regards to the gifting uh, clause, there's not a concern per se in that area because they do receive public funding from State Department of Education. Uh, but the recommendation, and I think this was in the city manager update last week, is to leave that $13,000 in to the budget. That does give us the flexibility to look at what type of program that would that would support, uh, but that it would not be it would not be rolled out before having a circle back conversation with the council on what does that proposed program look like. Um, so that is the the recommendation for that. The other item was Indian School Road. There was a question about uh, median enhancement for that proposal. And as a reminder to Council, we have funding in the current CIP that's adopted today to widen two extra lanes on the segment of Indian School between Saraville and the 303. And then in the 10-year plan, there is also a six-lane build-out uh, currently proposed for fiscal year 23. And the question was, will that full build out include a median? And um, that is part of the plan is to include a median in that uh, long term build out. Bill? Kim, I've got questions on, on both of those. It, and it just, the first one is the uh, pilot. Mm -hmm. This is an on, we already have after school rec programs, <coughs> correct? Um, no. You mean, oh, you um, mean through the recreation? Left side, Nathan, yeah, Nathan, yeah. yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. School pilot. Okay. Thank you, Nathan, coming forward on this. Mayor, council member, step up. We do not currently have after school uh, programs right now in the schools. That's so, the, that we fund, correct? So the very first program that we would fund was suggested in this charter school it's one of the schools that we were we were looking at yes okay so it is actually a pilot then it is a true pilot uh, program for us. okay that's up. that was all i had that was the semantics on that one so my other question relates to this indian i've school. got a question on that oh is there any way that we are going to do a pilot program at a public school rather than the charter yeah, the currently right now most elementary schools in Goodyear do have after school programs provided by um, the school districts um, and so we saw a need in the charter school area and uh, that's kind of where we were focused at right now it doesn't have to be that of course we're, we're going to take this back and uh, re-examine and explore it further but, we um, but, but that is where we identified a need I'm sorry. We have child care programs. Some there are there are there are after school programs being offered in the other with public schools. With the exception schools, of ones that we've been discussing with this um, Alicia Felix, correct? And some of the others, and 
uh, I look forward to that that conversation. I think that will be good and see where the need is most of all within our city for right. those kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. there. And that's off topic. So, all right. Okay. Okay. Question two. Yeah. You ready? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, the Indian school uh, thing, and we started this dialogue last week, and and then. Uh, met with uh, deputy city manager to um, try to figure out what my question was and how we could get there. So that was what started this meeting that we had on Friday. And it, originally what my question was is in this current fiscal year, we have 500,000 set aside to do this um, road improvement in that area. And then we don't really address the medians and the the rest of that project until 2023. And I remember this conversation starting not at the last retreat, but the retreat before when we were talking about this is the gateway from the 303 into our community on the north end. And we're gonna we're gonna leave it barren until 2023. <coughs> and is there a is there an option for us to consider doing the work now or at least putting the medians in, you know, saving the 500, you know, it's a typical government thing. We're going to lay down pavement, then we're going to come back and dig it up a few years later. Can we do it? Is there a way to move something around and make it so that we can do this now? Maybe not the six lanes now, but at least put the medians in, you know, that beautification, the economic development, the welcome to the city. You're not driving, a, you know, a two-lane road before you get to this massive six-lane road that Indian School turns into. At Cerebral, um, and is is there a is there a way to to take advantage of that now? We've got ADOT out there with construction equipment; they're already mobilized. We're getting ready to do this. We're, you know, I, I don't know that we're far enough down the road yet to um, it, where we're going to really be disruptive if we say let's not do the 500, let's plan for the whole thing and let's get it all done in one fell swoop. So I'm throwing that out to the council about changing some of our priorities and using that as a project to, to move forward sooner rather than later. Well, go ahead. Uh, who wants to start first, Larry or Brian? If I could start yes. just to set some framework to yeah. this conversation. Um, that particular project that goes to the six lanes and the median is part of the IIP, which is funded by <coughs> development impact fees. Those development impact fees are zoned now, as you'll recall. Senate Bill 1525 required them by area. And so there's only about four projects north of I-10 in that zone. And the first of those, I think the earliest when um, Kim did a quick look through on it. The earliest of taking those fees funded by impact fees would be fiscal year 19, and that would be moving a couple others away. Did you have that list of them there Jeff? just to make it easier? Um, what, what is the money? What money are we talking about for that median? It's two, two and a half million, I okay. believe. Right, we have right now in fiscal year 23, there's just about $2 million, uh, for the widening of the, the six lanes and, and the final improvements. Uh, as Larry mentioned, that is funded by development fees. That's an IIP identified mm -hmm. project. And in looking at what are some potential options for uh, having engineering evaluate, can we reprioritize, there are only three other projects that are in the CIP that fall within that zone for development fees. That is uh, N2, just for reference on the CIP document. I think I might have it. Uh, but that's McDowell and Citrus. And then the other is McDowell Road, Citrus to Loop 303. And then we have Indian School at Cotton Lane. Uh, those are all uh, the only other projects that fall within that North Street zone. For tough yeah, yeah I, that's, that's a tough one. Brian yeah and one thing I would offer up because roads they, really they are the uh, uh, gateway to our cities and certainly understand that um, it, it, it one of the things we're talking about and uh, and you know with uh, our 
management team this morning. We have an opportunity, I think, to be in front of council again um, for a couple of things. One is, is we have some studies that are going to be coming to us. Uh, one in particular is a Urban Land Institute, um, ASTAP, the Arizona Technical Assistance Panel. And they're, they're making recommendations uh, for consideration of dressing up, for example, Litchfield Road um, and, and some of the other areas of the city, which would be south of I-10. Different funding, um, because as uh, Finance Director pointed out, we, we are zoned as it relates to our development fees. But the other part of it is, is what other one-time monies um, can we use to speed some of these along? And that's always an opportunity we have to discuss every year. Um, I do uh, w what I would, uh, one of the things I would encourage with council is we take a hard look as far as where we want to focus and prioritize. It doesn't matter if it's north, south, um, but if we have an opportunity to bring other one-time dollars toward it, um, that, that is a prioritization pro uh, process uh, we feel like we would like to do with council. Um, again, council not having the benefit of seeing the, the Urban Land mm -hmm. Institute study where we had a panel of um, uh, really some well um, uh, very high level professionals that took a hard look at our city. So uh, those things are out there as well and I just wanted to make sure that council was where we may have additional opportunities um, uh, <coughs> south of I-10 mm -hmm. as well. Any other comments from council on this? I mean, could I ask a city manager question? Did, did, we, did, did we get a million from ADOT to repair the damage the trucks did to that road? Yes, it was right at a million dollars. And um, that was, uh, and uh, ask Bob Beckley, our deputy city manager, as far as where we can use that million dollars. But it was for uh, the, the roads that they're kind of tearing up while they're going through this construction yeah. of the 303. Yeah, that, there's a breakdown, and there's a number of roads that are stipulated where we have experienced uh, unusual traffic as a result of the detours. And those were designated, and we have a cost per each street for roadway repair. And that can't be changed. That is their days. That is. That's what we had told uh, okay. the state where we we're going to and that's use how those the funding. funding came in. Yes. Okay. So how much did we get for Indian School? Because that was one of the primary routes throughout <coughs> all of that. Indian School, the the primary portion was re replaced. That was the older section that was in really bad shape that was oh, yeah, replaced. That. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the rest of it, uh, I don't believe that, I'll have to verify that as far as the exact breakdown of that. I don't have the numbers on that. Okay, thank you. So we might have already spent all of our money fixing it. The money that was spent, I don't believe, tapped into that, uh, that oh. account. Good. That was uh, uh, established by uh, CIP previously. Oh, good. Well, then we might have a little bit built somewhere. Brian, you had a comment on that? I, I would just comment also and to answer uh, Councilmember Stipp's question, and that may even be one that Councilmember Osborne alluded to on parks, um, asking Finance Director what uh, what opportunities are there at this uh, this point in the budget to um, allocate additional funding or even moving around? Understanding that we have sacred uh, fees with economic or excuse me development fees, they're restricted on where and how we can use those. Uh, but Larry, an open question to you is: Is there other items that are talked about with council? Um, are there any other abilities um, in, in but and Kim also in your opinion where monies can still be allocated at this point? Um, I and I'm putting you on the spot for that, but just uh, the reality of where we're at. Yeah, um, happy to um, kind of address that first at a very high level. It has and and we talked about it this spring as we went through the IIP and the CIP, and the discussion was the timing wasn't perfect. The timing wasn't perfect in that you would like to do both of those prior to all of these master plans being completed. It would have made the whole process as we did our first 10 year CIP to have already had those in place. But we didn't have that luxury because of the timing and the requirement for the impact fees. But the capital improvement plan, and we are making significant investments over the next 10 years, general fund and so forth, uh, outside of the impact fees. The impact fees, the IIP portion, which is the impact fee portion, 
<laughs> is a little more rigid than than the general fund money but always our intent this fall in the retreat with the council is you're gonna by that time you're going to see the park master plan you're going to see the transportation master plan you're going to have had an opportunity to just to digest that and there is an opportunity then to take a second look at those capital improvement plan items now if we were to go back to this particular budget that is for this fiscal year and where are the big capital improvement plan dollars going that are general fund discretionary mm -hmm. So if there was something that really you wanted to either hold or, you know, move around, a couple of them that really jump out that, that make the bulk of the dollars. This isn't all of it, but it's, it's the bulk of it. We increased the general fund uh, capital improvement plan contribution from about $3 million to $9 million. Um, Fiscal year 15 being $9 million, fiscal year 14 being $3 million in new money, okay? That $9 million is absorbed very quickly in a couple of items. One is the ERP. That's about $4.5 million in the budget that was set aside for replacement of our um, com computer system. Mm -hmm. The second is operations facilities for public safety. Uh, that uh, and by operations that's not the 911 center but that's the operations facility and in fact that carries into next year and be between those two we have is it six million about seven about oh. seven million between fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 16 that's some of your big dollars that are in the early part of the process and from council discussions <coughs> in the past they are incorporated as part of fiscal year 15 funding those can be looked at if that's the council's desire, but fiscal year, as we're looking at the 10 year, I think that it's safe to say that everything in the 10 year will be reevaluated after you've had a chance to look at those plans and study a little bit more. Thank you, Larry, because that's what I was thinking. That's what the 10 year plan is designed for. It puts out all the information and it does allow us to move it out. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I, I have to say that I, I can't conceive that uh, the public is going to say that little area on Indian School by those areas needs to look the best of anything else that's going on in the city. I just don't think that's it. And I know they tear it up and I know it happens all the time, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's hard, it's hard when you have a, a, you have a revenue source that isn't, it isn't huge. So you're really taking those resources and you're putting them out to those things that are going to most benefit to the people's quality of life. And I'm not so sure that's going to hit the quality of life. And so in my opinion, um, I, I would not want to change. I do like the idea that we can still move that project up closer as the next year or the year after. So uh, that's my position. Mayor, there was one item that I didn't mention in that that goes outside the CIP, and Kim has referred to it, and that is we have put the $5 million as a set-aside for replacement. That number is very high, as we indicated, and we don't know, as, as the Vice Mayor's question earlier, we don't know exactly where that's going to be earmarked, and until <coughs> asset management plans are in place, we have no intention of earmarking it because you really need to same concept that we talked about master plans make sure you know what you're doing and that you're doing it in a structural manner that number could be reduced i wouldn't advocate it in that i, I just want to remind you there's a few things that we've talked about the granite alone replacing the granite alone i think in our medians we once received a number of almost four and a half million dollars by itself uh, then you've got the park equipment replacement over the years uh, that needs to not nearly in those kinds of numbers but when well, you add some of the others life. about I'm saying yeah. the citizens quality of life not that that is an important bill um, but I just in my opinion with the budget we're on now and the expenditures we have and all that I just don't think it fits in at this time uh, Joe yeah I I would tend to just dis, not discourage discourage you know that if you don't know where that five million is going to go to 
I mean, it looks good sitting there to thinking that, well, there's some money there that, you know, we can tap and replace later. I would rather not touch that until we really know what we, we need sitting in there, um, you know, for the replacement equipment. There's always that one possibility. You know, you have that appropriation at, what, $31 million there. If for some reason there's a windfall of, of money that comes in, the reason why that money is set, that appropriation is set up is to cover deals like that if council wanted to go back and revisit something and they found a project they, they'd like to do, but it was above and beyond what was budgeted, this money comes in, you have wiggle room to do that with that appropriation. You could. So, you know, um, uh, but that's something that would have to be above and beyond, you know, what you've already budgeted. Any other comments? Joanne? I have a lot of questions and I'm not going to eat up time, so I'm going to, I'm going to send them to you two and uh, uh but you may eat up time because that's what we're here for and the citizens want to hear it so well some i think are items that you've already gone are. over and um I, I think part of my feeling and you know i wasn't here when I, um certain items that come before us uh for example you had um at the last meeting when, after i had left and it was the um the grant money the the money that we were doing as um oh Bill, what was EDS. it called? I'm sorry? The EDS. The EDS. And um, understanding how, you know, it's one thing to do studies and to do plans, and that's our responsibility as a city is to do it, but to understand, okay, is this a book on the shelf that we don't have any money to follow up to carry out this plan? Did we just spend $75,000 on a book that doesn't help us actual equipment for a park and me not being here last week I don't know what the answers were and so did you not go ask anybody this week I, don't, I mean this week no I mean, did, and that's why I said I have many questions that I don't want to eat up everybody's time here but it's that it's I sit there looking at it going I would rather have that put into a park you know I don't understand it because if it's not we don't have the money to follow through on action to plans and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. I need to understand what this um, 250,000 um, facilities plan for 20 years is. I don't know what this means. And so I just don't want it to be a book that's two, that's two years too early when we could be spending 250,000 on parks or something else. Th so those are we have questions beyond briefing, this uh, scope right here. Right now, do we have a briefing set up with Joanne on this? because uh, So I can get back up to speed here. <laughs> Um, no, we want to be back up to speed, yeah. and, and there's no reason yeah. why you, you couldn't have been back up to speed. Absolutely, ahead. Mayor Council Member Osborne, we'd be happy to uh, bring you up to, to speed uh, because it does. It moves fast, uh, and uh, a couple of things. One on the EDA, Economic Development Administration grant, um, just real quickly. That's one that is about a sixty-four, sixty-five thousand dollar match from the city um, for the hundred fifty thousand dollar grant. Um, that and vetted by council last week, but that's an opportunity. We you do not get opportunities from EDA, um, at least a community of our, uh, I would say, affluence. Uh, but this uh, there's there's a lot of excitement around the airport area for this to work and, and partnering with City of Phoenix and others. So, but this is a planning grant that will get us there. And, and the beauty of EDA is when you have the planning grant that's done. Then you find out, where, is, it, is the project feasible to do an incubator accelerator? Um, is it feasible? Where should it be located? How do you organize it, um, a, an incubator program? Uh, and as importantly, is it gives you an opportunity to get uh, bricks and mortar grants potentially from EDA as well. So um, that, that's what was talked about a bit last week. Um, and the $250,000, that was a management initiative. Uh, it's it's very difficult for us to look out at, and see what do we eventually do with the IOB, uh, where do we, uh, the um, interim office building, um, how long do buildings last, um, what should we sell off, when do we sell off the Duncan farm, uh, what do we do with some of our other uh, assets, real estate. Um, going out, and, and we're saying 20 years, but fundamentally it would be more like 10 years, we're growing quickly. And what are the priorities as far as uh, uh, a master plan for facilities? Because it's very difficult to know how long a building will last us and how quickly we have to uh, start preparing for um, new administrative offices or maybe it's public safety and those types of things. What do we do with um, these facilities, you know, 10, 15 years from now? Um, so that, that was the intent behind that because we just do not have 
uh, a good game plan in my estimation as far as where we'll be longer term <coughs> with our city facilities. But I'd uh, be happy to go in more detail at an, uh, another yeah, time I as well. Yeah, I think we should set up a private. Thank you. Way. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll move to the uh, property tax portion of the presentation. Um, we adopt a property tax levy every year as part of our budget, uh, and that's essentially the revenue that the city receives from property taxes paid. Uh, it's broken down here between primary and secondary. Uh, and this is also based on our assessed valuation for the city that's given to us by the Maricopa County Assessor's Office. And we talked a little bit about this in the revenue presentation, but important to note, um, our levy uh, this year is 11.9 million, and that's based on our assessed valuation of 659 million. Uh, that's about an 11 percent increase over our assessed valuation from last year, and uh, probably more exciting is the first time we've seen an actual increase in that number since the recession hit. So uh, that's kind of the driver for the numbers that you see here. Uh, it is broken down by primary and secondary, and I've listed on here how they correlate to our adopted policies in the budget. The primary property tax levy does support our general operations. That dollar amount is six, um, excuse me, 7.4 million, and it does consider our 2% maximizing of the primary levy uh, as per our policies. That about $418,000 increase that you see there is broken down on the slide between what we call the truth and taxation amount, and that is the amount of increase on existing properties versus the 273,000, which is attributable to new growth in the community. And then we have our secondary property tax levy, 4.5 million, and that is used to pay our debt service on our existing general obligation bonds. And um, as I've noted there, we have a floating uh, tax rate that allows us to make sure we are collecting the necessary levy to cover those obligations. Joe? Um, is, the, uh, is it fair to say the ratio on that increase on the secondary, Larry, is comparable to the TNT and the uh, the new growth. I'm going to answer that that it it's logical to say, but I can't tell you if it's fair or not. We okay. do not get the data from the county broken out in the secondary, <coughs> and so what seems on on the surface to right. be a very true statement, as we went into some parcels looked at them that went from ag to residential, ag to commercial. Mm -hmm. It got complicated and I truly can't, can't tell. tell you that. But the logic, I would say, I, I, I will not fault your logic, I just can't tell you that I've ever seen any numbers that would prove it. Well, the only reason why I was trying to get to the number, when you, when you see the, what is it, $800,000 overall increase, if that, and for argument's sake, if that's 8%, you know, I was trying to get to a number that 4 is new and 4 is existing, mm -hmm. y y you know what I mean? But if you can't get it on the secondary, you can't get it on your secondary, so you can't get to that number. But you see where I was kind of going with Absolutely. that, is to try to figure out uh, that increase is just not, you know, who are existing homeowners. There's the new assessed valuation that comes on, and to try to get a handle on that secondary, what that amount is, so. It would be nice if we could because it kind of really tells the tale of what the actual true increase for those that were existing, you know, uh, in the prior year as opposed to, you know, the new ones that were added on there. But, okay. Joanne? And Larry, didn't you also say that in the, I thought it was in the secondary that when we had refinanced some of the loans that last year we felt the savings rather than the coming years and so that was also the difference you see? Uh, that is Some. very correct that okay. the reason that the amount of the levy increased this year over last year on the secondary because normally that wouldn't increase mm -hmm. because we haven't issued new debt but what happened is is in the previous years we did some refinancings mm -hmm. we took the benefit of it right. when we were still in the place that our our assessed valuation was still dropping mm -hmm. and and the rate was going up dramatically and so at that point, uh, yeah, we, we had an artificially low. Our actual debt service paid by the general fund, we still have a little bit of that benefit in there. Our actual debt service paid by the general fund, or excuse me, by the secondary property tax, the debt service fund is actually closer to about 4.8 million. So we'll see that number rising in the next year or two. 
but still with the new properties coming on board, they're, they're covering some of those costs. Absolutely. I think it's fair to say, you know, actually in the ratios, I can't fault your logic. And you, you look at the, the, the number up above at the $400,000 increase, you kind of double that that says that's 800 of which 300 is coming from uh, existing <coughs> and 500 is coming right. from new construction. But there's no way to confirm that, though. No way to confirm okay. it. Correct. Go ahead, Kim. And so with that total levy that we uh, receive each year, we then use that to uh, actually get the calculation for the property tax rate. Uh, so you'll see here, as we showed on the last slide, our current fiscal year, our total levy is 11.1, .1, and the actual rate to collect that was $1.90. And for fiscal year 15, as I mentioned, our total levy is 11.9, <coughs> uh, but our rate is actually going down to $1.87 in part due to that increase in assessed valuation as well as growth. And what was the year, Larry, that we thought of the year finally back down 1.6? Uh, 2018. What was it? 2018. 2018. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So the capital improvement plan, and I will um, spend a little bit of time talking about the 10-year overview and then uh, also highlight the key projects in the plan, uh, not only for the next fiscal year, which will re receive the appropriations, but also over the 10-year plan. Uh, and as was mentioned, while we adopt the 10-year plan, and this is our first year expanding from five to 10 years, uh, the projects that actually receive funding are those fiscal year 15 projects. And so each year as part of the budget process, we do uh, have this discussion with the council at the retreat. As has been mentioned, we have a lot of new factors that will be considered as we have this next discussion with all the master plans being finalized, as well as Brian mentioned, we have the ULI study that will factor into that as well. Uh, but the 10-year look, we do have a $372.6 million 10-year plan. Uh, we did incorporate into the capital improvement plan those projects that are in the infrastructure improvement plan, so those growth-related projects. And so you'll see when you look at the chart and kind of the breakdown of the types of projects over the 10 years, significant investment in water, wastewater, and streets. And uh, that is definitely attributable to the development fees and the projects that were identified in the infrastructure improvement plan. Uh, we do also have, uh, as we mentioned, significant investment in facilities and technology, and that is specific um, to next year, fiscal year 15, uh, specifically in regards to the enterprise resource planning project and also our police operations facility. And I'll just talk a little bit about some specific projects. We did review this uh, a couple times at previous work sessions. Um, but this highlights in fiscal year 15, we have the phased park improvements that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's so we can make sure that our parks are performing up to our standards, as well as those unimproved median areas, providing some funding to enhance four of those key areas for next fiscal year. And you'll see that carried through to the out years uh, where we have phased that in. So uh, as Larry mentioned, we do have a significant investment and so we wanted to phase in and make sure we're continuing to move those forward and then also the police operations building and you'll see not only in fiscal year 15 where we have 3.9 million uh, but that additional 3.7 in fiscal year 16 uh, which will allow <coughs> us to get a phase one facility by the end of calendar year 2016 is when we're we're estimating having that completed but then in the 10-year plan, we also have some development fees that are associated with that project. That's the additional $4.8 million that you see there that would get us the full build-out of the facility. The ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning Project that I mentioned. We also have a developer contribution, which I'll, I'll show you in the next slide when we talk about funding sources, but for a new well and treatment facility, so we have funding identified for that, as well as uh, investment in our water reclamation facility expansion. And just a couple things to highlight in the out years, we do have the uh, Community Recreation Multigen Center, um, and that is the 9.9 .9 million. That is part of what was prioritized for using that one-time uh, pick set-aside funding that we have between now and uh, 2019. We took half of that funding and put it into the revenue source for our capital plan. Also, the City Hall is in there. As I mentioned, we do expect the ability to sell bonds 
in 2018. As you know, we have a policy that says we won't issue any new bonds unless our tax rate is a total combined dollar sixty or less. And so 2018 is when we anticipate the ability to sell bonds for that project. And then, as I mentioned, significant investment <coughs> in our uh, water infrastructure as well as uh, fiber and pavement management. So this slide, it covers all the individual projects for fiscal year 15, the significant ones I just highlighted, but the important piece here uh, is the funding source. Uh, we do have a total of $27.98 million for fiscal year 15 projects. And as I mentioned, development fees is, is a significant funding source. So over half of our uh, project funding for next year is coming from development fees. We also have the developer contribution, $3.9 million for the well and treatment facility. And then as Larry spoke of earlier, we have $9.4 million in general fund that is uh, attributable most significantly to the ERP project as well as the police operations facility that I mentioned. Quick question, Joanne. Yeah. Um, just for clarification, have we always had, this may sound like a really stupid question, but have we always had development reimbursements in our CIP? I didn't, I don't recall that in the past, being in the CIP. Uh, under, this is a very unusual transaction in that it was part of a development agreement where they paid the cash up front and put aside, and for us to run it through our books, we have to appropriate it. That would be different from a traditional developer contribution where they put the infrastructure in and turn it over to us. We do not keep that. You would not see that in here. So it's a bit so of an unusual. Yes no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't think they were normal in there. Right. The next uh, and last segment uh, that I will review is our debt service. Uh, we do have a total of $25.8 million built into our budget next year. Uh, this does show a breakdown of how we are funding that. Uh, the biggest piece is that $10.6 million funded by the utilities, and that's for uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. We have the improvement district at $3.5 million. That does show as an obligation to the city, but if you recall, that is associated with our McDowell Road improvement district. And so the landowners that are within that improvement district actually pay the assessment on that, and uh, we do have a corresponding revenue source for that. Uh, the general fund is that $6.8 million. That is where we see the uh, Vanita, as well as our uh, public improvement corporation bonds for the ballpark, and then our secondary property tax, which pays the uh, general obligation bonds that we talked about. So that concludes my review, um, and just by way of next steps, uh, as I mentioned, if there is anything that the council would like to see brought back for additional discussion, uh, we do have the ability to do that. Um, I didn't have any notes in particular for items to bring back in a work session, um, but I can review that. Uh, let's throw that out right now, if anybody has in mind at this moment. If not, then um, Wally? If I may be in on the briefing with Council Member Osborne, because I was not at the work session last the meeting, phone, yeah. and I was on the phone for the business meeting, and I did not get everything that you said, although I was trying to follow it. It's very it's difficult hard to hear. Yeah, it's difficult. So right. thank you. So we'll set that up this week? Yes. yes. And by way of follow up, in addition to the briefings, um, I have just a note, uh, as we've talked about with the retreat, that we will look at that long-term capital improvement plan and uh, discuss with the council any reprioritization that we want to evaluate in the context of the plans. And then also uh, a breakdown of what ADOT gave us for street repairs uh, in regards to the additional traffic. Good. So that's the only follow-up I have. And then, um, Brian? Um, so we're, it sounds like now we would not be scheduling a budget work session for this coming Monday and just wanted to, to confirm that 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 was part of uh, the reason for the recap there so, uh, because we will be doing budget briefings um, uh, individually uh, but is there any other appetite for any item that you'd want us to bring back forward I just have I'd like to compliment you because the no. way you've done it this year and, and segmenting it the way you have and the, 
information we've been given ahead of time, and, and, and the presentation is so much more understandable. It gets it's improved year after year. Um, so I, I thank you for that, and I think that the public will be able to understand this far better this year when this is put on the website, if it, when it is final, uh, will be much easier. And I'll be interesting to, to hear their comments and questions uh, because I think it is um, well presented and understandable. So, so thank you, Kim. I know you worked real hard. And Larry, thank you. And, uh, and the committee and everybody else has worked on this this year. So anything else? All right, well, thank you. Um, so, council members, do you have anything you want to report on current events? I have yes. something Probably. if I may do so. Um, last week, oh, no, wait a minute, was it this week? No, it was last week. Um, last week, I had the opportunity to attend Arizona Town Hall, uh, and the uh, it was the 104th Town Hall, and the topic was Arizona's vulnerable population, and um, I was very happy to um, come home knowing that our city has services available for our residents, and I did not come home with any new program that needed to be started in our city, and in fact, in sharing what we already do with uh, our Faith Roundtable and uh, all faith food bank and uh, a lot of people uh, in my panel uh, were very complimentary to our city for being so forward because we were actually on the cutting edge of many of the things. So that was very nice. Um, I also attended the Southwest Valley Chamber Home and Life Expo. That was fun, and it was over at the Hampton Inn, and it was full of people. I enjoyed that very much. Um, but most of all, this this past Thursday, was my last issue day for Leadership West. Hoo-hoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Graduate. I graduate uh, next, uh, the first Thursday in June, whatever date that is. Uh, but we, that day was uh, Talent Day, and I really uh, was so proud of some of the employees from our city. Specifically, Nathan Torres was there for the Cactus League and just did a wonderful presentation. And Christian Williams, who, is Christian here? Oh, there he is. Mm -hmm. Yay. I have to tell you a story. <laughs> Christian said he never thought he would be limboing in front of a council member, but at the time he didn't work for the city, so that's another story. But he <laughs> was in charge uh, with two other Leadership West alumni to, to set the date. It was called Young Talent or Talent Day. And Christian did a wonderful job, and we were at the... Um, uh, Cardinal Stadium, and it was just great. But I had an opportunity to meet Tom Sadler, who is uh, president and CEO mm -hmm. of the Arizona Sports and Tourism Authority. Yes. Had a wonderful conversation with him. Good. Understand it much more than Good. I ever thought possible. And our own Jesse Peterson presented on our Innovation Hub and just did a fantastic job. And everybody was uh, uh, no one there in my class knew that our city even had this, and they were very uh, interested in, and someone remarked again that Goodyear is always on the cutting edge now. So it's very, it's wonderful to have these compliments coming from people outside our city. So kudos to all these wonderful staff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. That's very nice. And a number of uh, council people have been to town halls. Oh, um, I was one on government. What was yours on? I've been on arts Total. and land challenges. Brian and I did oh, that one together. <laughs> Have any of you others gone to that? Well, it's highly recommended. Dirty. Oh, yes, you've been on several of them, you haven't you? Awesome. No, I've only actually one? been to one okay. on transportation. On transportation. Great. So that, you know, we might want to get the information out to the council again for the people that haven't uh, participated. Oh, and Mayor, our Christine Plant, our neighborhood services manager, was also there, and we were on separate panels. So uh, I don't know if our city sends two people each time. Although I heard Doesn't. that I heard that the Grand Canyon was the best Joanne, yes. and I yes. know that's where you I, I, I went. I went to, I went to Tucson. <laughs> so By invitation only. Oh, it was wonderful. It was great. I loved yeah. it. And then, and and I had gone to all of the the presentations that the town hall did in the greater Phoenix area and Flagstaff, but I'd never been a participant. So this was really wonderful to be on the other end. It, it really I enjoyed it. outstanding. So if we can get that out to the council people that have not attended, yeah. uh, it's 
a great venue. So. If I if I could just comment, I uh, attended my first town hall 20 years ago, um, <laughs> and I, I, I actually am I'm a chairman of the audit committee, so I'm familiar with it. Uh, Arizona Town Hall is by invitation only, and one of my responsibilities that I don't necessarily do a great job of is is to nominate people to attend these town halls as they come up. Other members can also do that. You can nominate yourself or someone else. That doesn't mean you'll get an invitation. They actually invite, you know, I, I, I think it's something like 15 or 20 percent of the people that are put up for a nomination are actually invited. Uh, but I think the city of Goodyear can safely always count so. on being able to have one elected official and a staff member at each town hall and probably not a commitment but probably be able to get those invitations uh, so I can be one avenue of it for those people that have interest you can channel through the city manager's office all I do is pass your name along as well as information I don't uh, I'm sorry if I misspoke on that you're right it is by invitation only but it's a great program. Uh, I, I heard when somebody else, uh, you know, had gone, and so I put it out that if it ever came up, that I'd like to be considered for it. So I guess um, everybody's going to be going to your office a lot. Right? <laughs> oh no, no, that's not the that's not the only or best way. Uh, that's not the only or best way. Uh, others have been nominated in a number of different. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. So. No other comments? I, uh, I would like to say one thing yes. that I did last week. Right. Yes, okay. did, yes, yes, yes. And that was, um, had um, I have continued to serve on the Business Advisory Committee at Australia Mountain Community College um, at their request. And they did a very interesting exercise last Saturday. Brian also participated not in, in uh, uh, called the Shark Tank. So there were two sessions. I served on the first session as one of the sharks, and Brian served in the second session as one of the sharks. And it was, the, it was a, a class, their final class project, and they had to come up with a business plan, and we, uh, we were the shark and, and asked them questions and encouraged them to get information and encouraged them as best we could. But it was a delightful exercise and it's really, um, it, it was really fun to see the, the, non, the new generation coming up with ideas for business. So it was, it was quite good. Uh, it was quite fun to do that and, and very different. Yeah, great. Do you have one thing, Joanne? The one thing that I made it um, to last week without having a coughing attack was um, the the chamber's annual board retreat, and and I did make it to that. And I think that um, something that may come out of this next year's board. Um, I had kind of talked to everybody about advocacy because sometimes the chamber. Um, could do some more advocacy. And so uh, I said, you know, it would be really nice. We always hear from large um, developers and things like that. What is it that you look for <coughs> in um, different plans that the city has and different, you know, just when we always hear, are you business friendly? And I said, are there things to you as a small business that means business friendly to you? And what are in some of those thoughts? And so I just put that out there, and everybody really wanted to dive into that. So that was was interesting. At the same time, I went through that, and to let you all know, I think you saw that I'm resigning from the chamber. And um, I've always enjoyed the chamber. I love it. I've been on there many, many years. But as you know, because we both are going to be serving on it, um, I have accepted an appointment to the Board of Trustees for the West Valley Hospital. And I know I've hit my saturation point of what I can handle, and so it was like, you know what? <laughs> the chamber can have some, some new blood going in there, kick butt. So that was the, my, my uh, exciting thing for the week, too. Good. Okay. Anything else? All right, well, let me just remind everybody that we have a work session on the 12th at 5 p.m. and a regular meeting at 6 p.m. So meeting adjourned. What's that, someone?